All right, all right, all right. What's up, what's up? So, we're going to go ahead and get kicked off here tonight. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in on Pantheon Radio. I appreciate everyone's time, and uh, we'll try to have fun with tonight. I've got a few things I want to cover just before we get started. Uh, so, everyone knows that the PAX pledge has ended. That ended on May 1st. So, for everybody that didn't get a chance to get into that, uh, maybe... Who knows, we might have one later down the road or something come up to where you can get in. Um, and potentially, again, there's always the pledges that are out there all the time. So um, maybe they don't have pre-alpha access included with them, but I know that they do have alpha access. So uh, be sure to pay attention to those guys. Uh, there's a lot of good pledges out there. So if you're looking to pledge to Pantheon, make sure you go check out the PantheonMMO.com and go to the pledge page there at the top. You can see it in pink. And from there, you'll be able to look at all the pledges, the tiers, and everything like that. But again, the uh, PAX pledge has ended, so we're back to kind of normal circumstances over the last few months that we've had. So uh, just everybody aware of that. If we hear any changes or anything, updates on that, we'll make sure to uh, broadcast those live as well. Moving on, so I believe the only thing I have as far as content creation goes, I want to give a shout out to uh, Call Me Cleese. Cleese released as one of his uh, podcasts here recently, a Q and A, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, with that, he <laughs> he uh, gave a little bit of a shout out to us here on the podcast. So uh, definitely props to Cleese on his uh, YouTube adventures, going very well. Very happy for the guy. He's doing an amazing job, you know, representing the community very well. So hopefully he'll continue to put out those great videos. I'll continue to watch them and get feedback on them. And uh, again, I'm looking forward to seeing the next one. So if you haven't already, guys, go check out Cleese. I'll make sure that we have a link in the description on the YouTube video here once it's posted on sacred bower i'm sorry forward slash sacred on youtube so make sure you're checking that out if you haven't already followed me on youtube besides that i'm going to go ahead and unmute myself i do have a uh, guest with us tonight we might have a few more pop in we're just gonna kind of have fun with tonight we've got a few topics we want to go over some of these topics can lead into some very agree to disagree situations or circumstances but Again, we'll uh, we'll talk through them. You know, this is a mature audience we have here at Pantheon. That's one of the things I love about the community. So, uh, well, they're experienced. We'll say we'll say experienced over mature. I'm not sure if I want to go mature, but again, we can have an adult conversation. We can agree to disagree at certain points, and we can give ideas, theory craft, assumptions, suggestions, and things like that freely without fear, fearing that we're going to upset somebody or you know ruin a friendship. So again. We'll have a fun with tonight. We got a few things we want to talk about: Sand Park versus Theme Park. Or sorry, Sandbox MMOs versus Theme Park MMOs. I know Brad did a post about this a little while ago, so we'll talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about zones, whether they're being overused or abandoned. Even what can we do to help prevent that? We're going to talk a little bit about some ideas around that, and then we'll go into level ranges, especially around zones. Like what's too big, what's too small, and what's just right. Is there just right? Is it just based off of opinions of everybody? So we'll go into a little bit of each of these, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, get over here into the chat. So, hey, Day, are you there, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. All right, cool, cool, cool. So I did a little introduction just to kind of warn people about you, just to make sure that they're aware that, you know, you're here. Um, we've got a few others that might come in here and stuff like that. So we'll continue to... We'll talk through it, and if someone comes in here and interrupts or jumps in the conversation, then we'll work with it and just go with it as we can. But with that note, um, we had some good conversations the other day. I mean, like, for people that weren't here and didn't get to listen to the conversations that me and Day have, we, we typically have these about, you know, three or four times a week, it seems like that. And uh, I love them. I, I truly love them. So it got me the idea. It got me thinking, you know, let's turn a lot of the podcast sessions into a lot of like theory crafting kind of assumptions of, um, you know, ideas on how they can do things or how we might see things being done that that makes sense to us. And we can also share our likes and dislikes with certain you know pieces and things like that. And uh, as I'm speaking about interruptions and stuff like that, hey, Mass, welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, Hey, uh, let me turn off voice activity so I'm not blowing up your show. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. So we'll uh we'll we'll get some additional opinions. Like I said, whoever comes in here, you're welcome to come in, share your opinion. Uh, the one thing we do ask again, we want to make sure it's very clear. These are assumptions. These are theories. 
we're going off of a little information here and there that we might have on the game based off of streams we've seen or you know things posted online, something like that. But for the most part, these are purely assumptions, theories, and just opinions ourselves. So please don't get it mis you know, please don't mislead yourself or let us misguide you that this is how Pantheon will be. We are simply just stating some of our opinions, some of the things that we've experienced in the past, and some of the things that we would like to see potentially changed or done a little differently, maybe throwing some ideas out there and things like that. So with that, we'll go ahead and kind of jump into it. And I wanted to jump into my thoughts on, I, you know, I don't know if you've got a chance to read Brad's post when he did this. He did this, I think it was, when was this post? It was, um, let's see here, September 16th, 2017. So it's been a while. It's been out there. But he talks about sandbox MMOs versus theme park MMOs because he uses those terms very often. And when he's talking about Pantheon, he tends to use these term terminology quite a bit. So he, he kind of went into a little bit about what the terms are and gave a little bit of an explanation. But I wanted to kind of give a little bit of my opinion on the differences. Now, sandbox, of course, Brad made sure that it's very clear. Sandbox means that it's just open. It's just, you can do pretty much anything you want to do whenever you want to do. It's just, they just throw you in there. There's no direction. There's no rhyme reason. It's just, it's just completely open. Uh, it's kind of like what Minecraft, I think is, is about as close as you can get to a sandbox. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, think of it that way. There's really no path to take. It's just wide open. And then theme park, Theme park is very linear. Theme park, they're, they've they got you on the rails. They're guiding you through the game. If you want to think of a, a theme park game, I mean, basically it's like taking an RPG where they're telling you where to go, when to go there, and, and kind of the entire road to where they're guiding you through the content. They're directing you from one path to the other, whether it's via quest, whether it's via dungeons, whether it's via just some sort of level uh, boundaries, something like that. They're guiding you throughout the game. So... It's a theme park as, you know, kind of like a theme park would guide you around the park to make sure that you hit all the main attractions. They want you to, they want to kind of make that path so you can travel the entire park. And it's not so much you're just free to go wherever you want, but they kind of got a path set out for you to kind of guide you where you should go. So they're not telling you you have to go there, but they're, they're guiding you. They're kind of pushing you that direction. So again, um, that's my thought. That's my take on when I, when I hear the word sandbox or theme park. But when it comes to MMOs specifically, there's things that Brad mentioned himself, which I'm glad he brought this up. If you have, say, a sandbox MMO, it doesn't mean that it's completely wide open because, again, there would be no path that, that's being taken. So you have to have some sort of path in place, but it can be a very large path. You can, you can have a lot of options within that path. Or you can have more of a theme park where it's very narrow and you have very, very few options to determine which way you want to go. So I'm hearing the terms when I hear Pantheon that it's going to be more of a sand park MMO versus a theme park. Or, wow, if I can say that one more time, sandbox MMO versus theme park. I'm going to get it right one time. I've said that like six times already, sand park. I don't know why I can't get the two of them separated. But anyways... So with that, I wanted to kind of reach out. Guys, I mean, I don't know if you have opinions on this, but like, what's the defining factor between a sandbox MMO to you and a theme park MMO? Like, what's like a, a key factor between the two for you? Uh, hey, I'll jump in here, I guess. Um, yeah. So I think for me, sandbox is where you very much decide what you want to do with the game. The game gives you a world uh, as is, and it's your job or up to you to figure out what you want to do in it. Whether you want to go adventure, whether you want to set up a shop and be the ultimate tailor, whether you want to, you know, find mysteries that other people haven't found, that's entirely up to you. Whereas a theme park tries to grab your attention into certain locations where, you know, there'll be a lot of empty hunting ground and then a giant quest hub, which is the theme park that gives you all this. There's that's where everything to do it is. And it's it might send you out into the uh, wild space, but there's just a bunch of these theme parks all around that are where you spend 90 percent of your game time. I, yeah, I like that. 
to me, sandbox is you're plopped down inside the sandbox and it's your playground. Do whatever you want. You're free to go do whatever, basically anything you want. There's no nothing there to guide you or anything. Whereas theme park is more like it's telling you where to go. Maybe there's quest hubs and you can level up that way. But, you know, you, you're just following a path or a couple paths. And you really don't have the freedom as in a sandbox to really do what you want. So that to me is the two differences. So I want to ask your question, like what's the, I mean, cause I, I mean, I think we get the definition, but I, I do with MMOs. It's very hard because again, like, like Brad was saying there is, you can't really have just one complete sandbox or you can't just have one complete theme park because it just doesn't make sense for an online multiplayer game. Um, now I guess you could have a theme park, but that would just be an RPG with other people on there. That's my take on it. But again, what's can you think of one game like particular that stands out to you as being the most like, okay, we've had some experience with different MMOs in our past. What's a good example of a previous sandbox type MMO that you can think of? Personally, I think uh, and I'm sorry to say this, I think EverQuest is a great one because, yes, they had little quests here and there, but you're pretty much dropped in that world and said, you know, left to do what you want. There might not be all the different sandbox features you'll see in a game like um, Minecraft, but it pretty much doesn't give you anything to do. It just drops you in and you can if you're me anyway, go drown in the river in the main town five times before you figure out how to get out. Fall off the city or fall out of the city, die, fall to your death like six times before you realize that you can't do that. Yeah. I was truly pathetic at the beginning of ever. I was too. So day yeah. is, I mean, I know that's a good one day. Is there any other games that you can think of any other MMOs specifically? EverQuest and Ultima Online is what, rings yeah. in my head i mean ultima online have some quest in it but as soon as you begin your character you're free to do whatever you want there was nothing telling you to go here or to there you know you just had your freedom um i like to classify minecraft into a category that i call mmop mass of multiple player online potential like you can play that game solo but you have the potential to play it with other people and I classify that as a style of MMO. Hmm, I like that. That that's really nice. I th I think I like that as well. I mean, one of the things that I know for me at least is when I'm looking at MMOs and I look at sandbox MMOs, I definitely I'm in the same boat with you on that. I look at Ultima Online as being a very wide open one as well. Just and I, I haven't even played it. I've just watched videos, I've talked to people about it. And to me, that it seems like it was very wide open. You were able to do a lot of things and accomplish, you know, uh, quite a bit without having any linear path, really. You kind of left you out there to do what you wanted. I think, and I don't know if this is, I mean, I, I, EverQuest, of course. I'm just going to kind of skip over EverQuest because I think EverQuest is my top number one as well. That's the one I played when I was growing up and, I, you know, caused me to fall in love with MMOs. But, um... I think it, maybe I'm wrong on this, but isn't RuneScape the kind of the same boat as well? The old school RuneScape. I don't know about the new one. You have another good example, Mass. Yeah, I do. What's that? Uh, um, Shadowbane. I know it was kind of a niche game back when it came out, but it let you. It dropped you in the world, gave you a little bit of a newbie zone to get you to understand the mechanics then brought you to the main world where you could build towns, siege towns, hunt, level up. It, it didn't tell, give you anything, any sort of goal whatsoever. Uh, you could hunt down all these rare uh, subclasses for your person if you wanted to and just completely um, customize your character if that's what you want to do. It had... It was all about giving you the power to just decide what the hell you want to do with your time. Okay. Well, like I said, I don't know if RuneScape was one. I thought RuneScape was kind of one as well. And that was I was trying to look for examples for people to go back and look and say, okay, 
I remember playing that game or I remember seeing that game. You know, this is what I can expect as far as kind of what a what a sandbox MMO looks like, or I can go look at it and see what it what they mean by that. So yeah, I briefly played RuneScape, but I don't know which version it was. So I wanna say kinda. Okay. I'm not sure. I mean that was just the best guess for me. So well, I'll skip over RuneScape. So EverQuest, Alto Online, and you said Shadowbane was another one that was Yeah, Shadowbane. Okay, I think I mean I think those are pretty good examples. We'll we'll leave it at that for now. Now, when it comes to theme park, I don't know about you all, but I, and I, I'm one of the guys. Now I'm going to go ahead and make this disclaimer. I played World of Warcraft for a very long time, but I consider yeah. it, I consider no, it a yeah no I consider it a theme park MMO. Yeah, it, I I would too. And. Agreed. The reason I'm going to say that, so people that are listening, if they are, you know, World of Warcraft fans and they feel like I'm, I'm talking down on it, I'm not talking down on it. it. It has its own right to be what it is. It is one of those deals where people enjoy that. People enjoy being guided via whether it's a quest or a dungeon line or something like that. Uh, people enjoy that type of, I guess you could say interaction within their game. They, they don't like having to try to figure it all out themselves. They like someone to kind of hold their hand and walk them through it. I think world of Warcraft did this very well. And when it first came out, even in vanilla, it was a little more harsh, especially than it is now, but it was also a lot easier than EverQuest was. And that was one of the things when I did the switch over from EverQuest in 04 to, to wow. One of the things I noticed was quality of life changes where basically it was holding your hand and kind of guiding you through the steps. And because you had some MMO experience already uh, from coming from EverQuest, it, it made the game very easy to get into and just, just go right through. The problem that I had with that was it didn't take long before I started feeling like, okay, I just, I want something that I don't know to come up. And, and that never happened in EverQuest. It was like from day one, I didn't know anything and I never did. It seemed like I was finding something out every single day new that I wasn't sure about. In World of Warcraft, it kind of felt different, the entire experience. And so, again, uh, I felt like that was holding my hand. It was guiding me, pulling me to where I wanted to be or where it wanted me to be at at when it wanted me to be there and things like that. So, um, most of the references I use go back to either EverQuest or World of Warcraft because that's, that's the most experience I have. Between the two of them, I have over 12 years gaming experience uh, pretty consistently. So there's a bunch of other MMOs out there I've tried and played a little bit here and there, which makes up for pretty much the 18, 19 years of MMO experience I have. But most of my time was spent between those two games. So when if there's, I don't know, I think most other games that are coming out nowadays are very similar to that in nature. Is that true or false? I mean, I, I can't speak for them all because I don't think I've played them enough, but... I think most modern games now tend to follow the the path that WoW has carved, where you know it's quest hub to quest hub, or there's some something in the game guiding you from one spot to the next to the next, and it gives you the impression that that's that's the path you have to take. Yeah, I think what you said there is just perfect. Like WoW set the tone for pretty much the modern MMO because of its breakout success. And by success, I mean how how well it appealed to such a gigantic audience. And I think it, part of that is that it came out at the perfect time. It had a established um, uh, canon to it with the, War, with the uh, Warcraft series and just they they put the effort into making that game. Um, I think there's a lot of negatives that have come from it in the MMO world in general, and I'm not ragging on it for this, but I think just no one wants to step away from that quote-unquote wow formula. They want to do the wow formula. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. <sighs> It's tough, and I don't want to. I don't want to sit here and, and go over that all night because we got some other things I want to cover. But I, I will say this: you know, I, you got to give credit where credit's due. You know, Blizzard came out with a phenomenal product at a phenomenal time. They had the right people in place. They had the right type of P 
GDPR. They had the right type of graphics interface. They, they had everything that made the game appealing to a lot of people. And it, over the years, has... They, they have learned a lot about player bases and MMOs in general over the years based off of what World of Warcraft has been testing and doing and trying. And, you know, they, they continue to try to set trends and some of them work, some of them don't. You see the player base result in that pretty, pretty obviously. So it's not like it's hidden. Uh, the numbers speak for themselves. You know, when, when things go well, they go well. When things go bad, they're, they're bad. So again, but they've done something and I give them credit where credit's due. They've done something, which is they've, they've kind of established themselves as the ones who are able to go out there and try to experiment and still be able to pull back players the next time that they release something. Like every expansion you see players come flocking back to see what they've done, if they've improved it, if it's worse, if it's better, because they have such a history with the game and they they, they know that at one point in time it was the game for them, so they're hoping that it goes back to that, you know, or it kind of resembles some of that same feel that they had early on. But uh, it just seems like, each time it's been a little bit of a different test here or there. And uh, I, I think now with, you know, what they're doing here in the next company expansion, they're, they're, they're kind of drifting back to where they, the roots a little bit at some, some degree, which is interesting to me. I'm, I'm seeing that in a lot of games. Hey, let's go back to the roots. Let's go see what's, what's missing. What, what did we do? Where did we mess up? Or where did we kind of shift that, you know, kind of, didn't draw that crowd in that we had before. Um, so I'm seeing that in, in other games as well, but I, I give credit where credit's due. They did a phenomenal job. Um, I, I think that, you know, they need, they deserve that credit. I'll give it to them. But I do agree that there were things that I missed tremendously when switching over from EverQuest to World of Warcraft. And one of the reasons I stayed with World of Warcraft for so long is because I made so many friends in EverQuest that came with me and we stuck it out and, and hung out for, for years, but I never really made new friends in WoW. And that was one of the things that killed me. So again, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in another session. We'll, we'll have a long discussion about that because I think there's a lot that we could go over between different MMOs. And I think there's a lot of new MMOs that are coming out that I have a lot of opinions on that we can talk through. But for now, I'm going to kind of shift the conversation. I want to drift over into zones and a lot of the the sandbox versus theme park mmos one of the things that i've seen is especially in sandbox where you can kind of do whatever you want to do at least from my experience i've seen that people tend to gravitate towards certain zones regardless and i think in everquest is pretty obvious with you know things like crushbone and unrest you know we me and day talked about these zones the other day or just even a few other ones where there are certain zones in the game that are very, very overused. They're overutilized. They're high density in mob count. They're um, just better all around for grinding levels. You know, there's a lot of population there. So a lot of people go there because they know there's going to be a group there type deal. There's a lot of factors that play into that. Why, why people are there and not elsewhere. Why people are all funneling into just a few zones because there's no path that says they have to go anywhere else. They, they have the freedom to choose the zone they want to go to. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the zones that have been abandoned over the years in MMOs and why they were abandoned, but also some of the zones that have been just overly populated consistently throughout the years and why that is like, was it, was it loot tables? Was it mob density? Like what, what was the factors? So, I'll start out with, with EverQuest and I'll look at Crushbone because I think Crushbone is, it's a pretty low level uh, zone. It's fairly small in size and reality, but I guarantee no matter what server you're playing on, it seems like you can go and there's always somebody in Crushbone. It's just, that's the way it is. You know, why, why is it that you have those low level dungeon zones like that, that people are funneling into? I think a lot of it's to do with mob density. I don't know what you guys think, but I think a lot of it's to do with mob density and just knowing there's going to be players there. I think that's part of the key. I think in terms of like how with EverQuest, it was certain zones gave better experience. Like I, I didn't know this back then, but I know now that so, certain zones had a hidden XP bonus to the zone. 
So a lot of people would migrate to those zones now because they give more, they give better experience. Um, another factor is maybe the travel top. Crestbone is very easy to get to. Um, whereas another zone may be a little bit further out, but you know, crestbone's easier to get to. So I think that matters. Mob density, I don't think it's necessarily mob density, but more along the lines of mob types. Like when I leveled my paladin here recently, I stuck to undead zones. I, like I never went to crossbow. I stuck to undead my entire time till I got to, uh, I think it was around 40, where I had like this 10 level stretch that there was no undead uh, places to go. And I just had to find another place to go. So mm. I think that is a factor for some classes. Interesting. I do. Uh, I do think with a game as old as EverQuest, part of the issue is that, like you said, these hidden EXP values are a lot better known. They're more upfront, and you know, of course, hey, I've played this game for however many years. If I want to level my character. I want the best EXP. I want to make sure I have safe leveling where, you know, um, for instance, take Befallen. Uh, I know that a, a ghoul isn't going to spawn on my level 5 to 10 or whatever level group and then at level 30 and then murder all of us. You know, we aren't going to get that random mummy spawn that's level 40 and have it wipe our entire group at the zone line where it's level 10 to 15. Um, Crushbone is a relatively safe zone to play, and there's a, it's pretty easy to run if you get in trouble. It's, there aren't any... You can pretty much judge what kind of level mobs you're going to be fighting. There's enough mobs, mob density, so that you can keep pulling and keep grinding that EXP, which, I mean, you just expand your camp if it's not that dense. But I think a lot of all of that comes into play, and I don't think loot comes into play at all, period. Because I don't think nowadays people care as much about the loot as they used to, because in the early levels, they kind of just assume everything that they get is going to get thrown out in another five levels anyway. Okay, so really, really good thought there. And I like that. So loot doesn't matter right now, but did it? I mean, because I can't honestly think of a time when it ever really did, besides maybe like the Crushbone belts for questing. But I never really, I never really went to Crushbone, and I was like, "Oh, I need to go here because of the loot." I honestly don't think loot matters until you hit around level, probably uh, twenty-five to thirty, when it starts mattering, where the levels start to slow down, and going somewhere where you know something useful is going to drop becomes the more popular choice over just. Mm -hmm. Um, that extra 2% EXP. Okay. So I got a question for you then. So I'll, I'll, we'll switch it over to kind of Pantheon now with the thoughts on Pantheon. Like if I'm talking about overutilized zones, I was talking today the other day and I was talking about how the way I see it is let's, let's use, and this is again, I want to make sure everyone is aware listening on the podcast as well as watching this later on. This is assumptions and theories uh, that we're using examples, which are probably bad examples, but uh, we'll, we'll use them anyways. So let's use an example. Let's say that we have a zone like uh, Helner's Cave, which we've seen in the streams. And Helner's Cave is, we'll say, a zone that goes from, it ranges from level 10 to 25. Or actually, no, I think the example we used the other day, we had them the same level range, right, Day? Yeah. Okay, we'll use that, we'll use that same example. So we have the same level range in both zones. So let's let's just use Helner Cave and let's use BRK. We've seen both of those recently in, in streams. Uh, they look phenomenal with Pantheon. But let's say that both of those zones have a level range of, and I think they said in 
the streams that it was like 8 to 35, if I'm not mistaken, in BRK. So let's yeah. say both zones have a level range of 8 to 35. So you have Helder's Cave and then you have BRK. Now, again, talking about overutilized zones. Now, for that level range, because, I mean, Crushbone was level, what, 5 to 20, I believe it was? And then you yeah, have... Yeah, 20, I think, though, was kind of stretching it out. Yeah, like, but, I mean, you had Unrest, which was level 10, or roughly just over 10, to, what, 35? Yeah, but, you know, that 35 was stretching it, so Polly could leave, like, maybe four or five levels below that. So we'll say but, 15 to yeah. 30? Yeah. Okay, so we'll say 15 to 30 for Unrest, like the common levels there. So... Uh, and this is unrest in EverQuest, of course. But so when looking at the zones, you know, what would make you in Pantheon? Because we know how unrest and we know how Crushbone went. But what would make you in Pantheon want to go to Helner's Cave over BRK or vice versa? And one of the things that I heard just a min mention ago was Crushbone was easy to get to. I think that's a huge one. So, yeah. I think regardless of, of what loot drops in said zones, if they're all the same levels and ranges, I think loot's going to be paid attention to. It's going to be noticed, but it's not going to be the key sole factor for deciding where and when you go somewhere. I do think ease of access is a huge one, though. I mean, if I start out and all of a sudden I'm basically, I just kind of stumble into one of these zones, that's probably the zone I'm going to end up going to. Now, if I can easily get to both of them, now that makes it a little different. I might have to actually decide. There might be other factors that come into play there. But depending on the ability and access I have to them, definitely I think ease of access is a huge one. So the example I'm going to give here is one of the things I was thinking, if you have, like, for example, in... Uh, in EverQuest, the, one of the reasons I think we had a lot of people funneling into places like Crushbone and Unrest was, one, like you said, they were kind of easy to get to. Two, uh, there was a lot of mobs there and mob types that were not easy, but they were definitely consistent. You, you never really kind of ran into a situation where there was a roamer or something that really just ruined your day without you at least kind of being aware of it. You knew how to watch out for it. It didn't take long. People figured it out. And you could uh, you could bounce between these zones because they're relatively close to each other. You could go from one zone to the other pretty quickly. So I was thinking, I was like, so what if I had more or less, uh, we'll say just for sake of argument here, I had six zones that were all between the levels 8 to 35 on three different continents. So I had two basically per continent. So with this, what factors are going to cause me, besides just ease of access, what are the main factors that are going to cause me to want to go to one versus the other? And like we mentioned earlier today, is that going to cause some of them to be abandoned or not? I think ease of access is a big one, of course. Yeah. I think if you're on one continent, you don't want to have to travel to the other. That makes sense to me right off the bat. Loot, I'm not too sure about loot. I don't know. I think we could maybe go back and forth on that. But I, I don't think loot... I mean, y'all, y'all. I think y'all maybe agree on me with this. I, I don't think loot's going to be a huge factor between the levels 8 and 35. Like, you're going to pay attention to it and you're going to notice it. Like, if there's certain types of... Um, like if there's something class-specific, maybe uh, some sort of scroll or something like that that's found in, in one or some ability that's found in one versus the other that, you know, you might have to go look for... Like, I can see that. Like, if I'm a shaman, because I'm planning on playing a shaman. If I'm a shaman and let's say I'm looking at uh, BRK 2.0 that's over in uh, Rainfall. And it, it, for me, I'm over on King's Reach. So, it's a whole continent away. There's a lot of travel involved to get there. And I know there's certain things within that zone that are better for me at, on my shaman. It's, you know, so... I want to get there, but even then, I mean, I would have to consider the risk versus reward. Is it really worth the travel, the travel time to get over there to try to get into that said zone? Um, or is it worth just staying to where I'm at until I can get some higher levels and then go back to it or something like that? Like what's going to cause these zones to not be abandoned, hopefully? 
And what could you th- like? What reasons would you think that you, would be put in place to make you travel from one to the other? Like make you go away from the one that's just right there in front of you and go to one that's a little farther away. Is there anything specific that you could think of? Um, really, outside of a friend being closer to that one and hunting it, not really. Um, maybe if it had, like you said, if we're talking about low enough, a low enough level where the loot really doesn't matter to me, that's probably not an issue. But if we're talking a level where it does matter, that might be something. Additionally, if I have a quest in a zone compared to not in another, that might also hold me there. Ooh, quest. For me, it, it would, I don't know, in my head, I'm thinking, let's say I go to uh, HC, okay. and there's more spellcasters there than other types. And those spellcasters hurt, they charm, they fear, they, it, it's just, it's an aggravation. But going there is kind of a little out of my way. But over in the keep, there's not that many spellcasters. They're more, you know, attackers. They they don't, I don't have such a headache dealing with them. I would be more inclined to go to that one, especially if I can find like a little area that maybe I can solo or I don't need a big of a group to do. But distance is a, really a big factor if i have if i can just get to one within let's say 10 15 minutes whereas the other one takes me a half hour to get to probably not going to go to that one over there that's like a half hour to get to unless i have a group or i've got a friend over there or something yeah yeah that 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 that's that's probably for me the bigger factor i will throw in that i will travel um for another reason where i'm an explorer i like exploring i don't like doing this same dungeon from the point i log on to the point i log off if i'm in a larger play session i like to see different things i get bored easily if i'm just you know sitting there grinding crush bone for five levels Uh, i'm gonna be i'm gonna be friggin crying about seeing too many orcs okay so no so that leads us kind of in the the next um piece here which is zone size i mean me and day had a really good conversation about this but i think all this kind of wraps into one big ball here which is like what what's zone size as far as levels go is just right like what's What's that just right? What's that not too big, not too small, but just right feel? And we have, me and Day have very, very different opinions on this. And I think that, Mass, you'll probably have very different opinions as well. Because I think it's it's very, it's very wide open. So for oh, yeah. me, when I think about level ranges in those zones, so like one of the things you mentioned, if if a zone's too far away, I'm it's very, very, very rare for me to think that I would travel two hours or an hour or 30 minutes even to get somewhere. If I don't have a friend that's there, like you said, or if I don't know something specifically is there that I absolutely need to have. Like if I have two zones that are equal for the most part in mob density, level ranges, difficulty, stuff like that, like, and I'm able to get groups in both. Like there's very little reason for me to think that I would want to travel from one to the other, except for maybe exploration or a friend. A friend is going to be the biggest one, honestly. So if I have a if I have a bunch of guild mates that are over at Helner's Cave and I'm at BRK, then maybe I want to shift over there because I want to be with them versus, you know, play where I'm at. I can see that's going to be a big thing. So when thinking of that, like what's the level range? I mean, like I said, if we had two zones that were basically mirror in levels from 8 to 35, we'll just kind of assume or make that theory there. So let's theory that the Hellner's Cave HC is 8 to 35 and then BRK is 8 to 35 as well or Black Rose Keep. Let's just, you know, assume that they're both level ranges around there. And with that, besides, the, like you said, you don't want to sit there for a long extended session. What's reasonable when it comes to should I be forced out of the zone 
at any level. Like, sh- like for example, Crushbone will say it says Crushbone was five to twenty, but as we kind of you know we know, it really wasn't. It was a little bit, probably a little bit higher than level five, maybe level six, seven, maybe maybe even, I guess you could say. I guess five to or six to seven was probably better for me. I don't think five was was at when I first got into Crush Point level five. I remember dying a lot, so it didn't until six or seven become a little bit easier just because I kept across a lot of centurions and things that wiped me on the floor. But I think around level fifteen, I also started to see a drop off in amount of mobs that I could you know kill and get experience from. So I agree with that. We'll, we'll narrow it down to about. We'll say 5 to 15, but then at 15 to 30 or so, you had unrest. So they were kind of back-to-back. I'm talking about two zones that are very, very similar in mob density, in level ranges, in difficulty, and really there's no rhyme or reason why you should want to go from one to the other. But is there a reason why they should, why you should want to get out of the zone besides just your free will? Like, me and Day talked about it, and Day, I think you said that you would like it to be some hard level gaps. Sort of, yeah. Okay. Um, Maz, do you have anything to say on that? Oh, yeah. I got plenty to say, but you go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, my thought is this, and, and it's slightly going off topic, and I will come back on topic from it. Okay. The idea of how quests are now in game in games, I don't like. Like, you do them to level up. They give massive experience. No. I think quests need to go back to its roots, where the purpose of a quest is lore and exploration. Maybe when you walk into that zone that has that dungeon, when you walk into the village that's in that zone, as you're walking in, maybe you start seeing in your chat box people talking about being attacked by bandits and and being raided and thieves and maybe there's one or two guys there that you know motion for you to come over one of them will eventually not necessarily guiding your hand that we see nowadays but kind of like would like you to investigate the dungeon for whatever reason and you and, and you eventually go there on your own whatever and let's say you clear the first level and you find a door, and the door is locked. You cannot open the door. If you have a rogue in your group, and the skill level is high enough, you can open the door and go to the second floor, and eventually the third floor. But if you don't, maybe you need to go back and talk to the guy that kind of not necessarily guided you there, but kind of asked you to go there to investigate. When you go back, he tells you maybe you know, that they've been seeing some bandit leaders in the zone or whatever, that maybe one of them has a key or something. And it's just the drop from one of those guys in that zone. And you get that key, and now you can open that door. Now you can go to the second floor. Not necessarily guiding you, but more along the lines of exploration and and lore. I think quests have room to explain what's going on in a village, in a zone, in a region, in the kingdom, on the continent, and the world, but not necessarily to the standards that we see today, where it's like, oh, you need to go here, and when you get done there, you need to go over here, and then there, and there. But more along the lines of just like, here's the lore of what's going on in this village, here's some of the lore in the dungeon, and if you follow it, you get more lore, but eventually you can open up more of the dungeon more along the lines of a story than than the quest that we know nowadays. And I'm okay with zones and dungeons having different levels and stuff like that. I'm okay with that. I just would like to see something in the game that at some point you're going to have to leave the dungeon, not necessarily to buy new abilities or to sell your, your what you've gotten, but something that's going to draw you out but then can turn around and draw you back if you want to go back in there. I think that is what I was trying to say the other night. Not necessarily a theme park guide in your hand, but something that goes along with the lore of that zone. Okay. So, so Mass, just to catch you up on our conversation yesterday, and I want to get your opinion before we 
So I've got about 15 minutes left on the podcast, but I'm going to continue the discussion a little bit after the podcast for everybody that wants to stick around on Twitch. But uh, for the podcast's sake, I I definitely want to get your opinion on this, Matt. But basically uh, what I want to get the gist of. So the other day, the conversation me and Day had, well, Day would like something that encourages you to exit that zone from time to time to go explore, to go, you know, whether it be there's a kind of a level gap or whether there be there's something um, perception or, you know, why is that really kind of it, it entices you to come out of the zone. My idea was I really want to have it to where it's just a, I mean, an option. Like you can make the choice whether like there's no real hard stop saying that you can't go from level 8 to 35 in a zone. It's more or less you're just able to continue right on if you want to. But at the same time, like you said, if you start to get bored, you have options to go to different zones, to go to different areas, to do different things between those level ranges. There's nothing holding you back from moving on, from doing other things. It really kind of opens the door up for you. So that was the gist of it. Did I get that kind of close to like you wanted something to encourage you to get out to yeah. kind of like kind of be in a, in a I don't say a barrier, but some sort of something that happens, whether it's level uh, ranges, you know, not being optimal or whether it's perception or something that draws you out of that area so that you go explore more. Versus me, I'm just kind of like, I would just like us to have more of that open feel where we can choose to go or not. Okay, so on that note, Mass, I mean, do you have, like, you're an outsider coming into the conversation. We had this conversation the other day, and it was a really good one. I had a lot of fun with it, and we'll continue to have it because I think it's fun. But I wanted to get your opinion for the end of the podcast here and just see if you had a zone that's 8 to 35, would you prefer that you find a kind of a stop or a block in it to, that forces you to go explore? Or would you prefer that it just kind of lets you do what you want? Well, you could level there from 8 to 35, or you can exit at any point in time and go somewhere else. Or you might have to, based off what camps are available or not, being open world and all. I think there's a more fluid way to do it than just the hard, oh, you need to leave now. Um, I think... Uh, talking about the quest like uh, Dayshawk was talking about. Is that how you say that? Dayshawk? Dayhawk. Dayhawk. Okay. Sorry. Um, where I'm going to use a quest from EverQuest, which was the um, it was the Thex Mallet quest. And the idea was you see meet an NPC outside of Befallen, and he tells you about this Thex Mallet, and if you bring it to him, he'll bring you a reward. And he tells you about who might be uh, holding on to it. And you have to go into Befallen, uh, find Skeleton Larad, which is on the first level, and a pretty low mob. And then down at the third level, there's also the Elf Skeleton, which drops the... Uh, one drops the mallet head, one drops the mallet shaft, and then you have to fuse it together and you get the mallet and bring it to him and he gives you a cool sword. Now, the catch is that the ske- <laughs> the elf skeleton is around level 20, whereas skeleton Rod is probably around level 12. So there is kind of a break in that. But I think really what should bring you out is that, you know, you go into a dungeon... You kind of have your eye on something. You do your exploring of the dungeon for your level range. You do your quest for that level range. And then, you know, you want to go somewhere else where you can get, uh, where there's other stuff you can get that you don't have yet. Um, for instance, yeah, okay, I've done the Thex Malik quest. Befallen's still cool for EXP, but... I could go over to Guck and there's a bunch of name mobs there that might have some different drops that would help upgrade my armor set instead. And I think that that could kind of keep you moving to different dungeons to get the different types of loot. Um, Does it have to be a dungeon? I don't know. It doesn't have to be a dungeon. Okay. It it could be something like collecting the terror spider silk in uh, South Row to make some kind of armor piece or something. Okay, okay. Um, But I think level range, whether it's too big or too small, is kind of a weird question. Because I think a a zone 
assuming you're willing to make the zone big enough to where each level, each, you know, groupable level range has stuff to hunt and a separated place to hunt more or less, you can make that level range as big as you want. The catch is that you want to be careful that it's not linear enough that the people at the highest level range have friggin two miles to run back to escape if they get in trouble because then we go back to abandoned zones no one's going to use that because it's just too unsafe it's too dangerous there's no way to get out if you get in trouble well and i mean it, yeah on the linear part and when i think of most of the zones i think of them being I, I think of like a circle not a not a path you know yeah i mean there's like I said, it's kind of tricky because making a circle, you also don't want lower levels to wander into suddenly you're looking at level 50 mobs at level 10. But you also want to make sure those people at the level 50 don't have to run through the level 40, the level 30, the level 20, and then the level 10 to get out of the zone. So it does take some tricky work, maybe a locked door like uh, Dayhawk said between the 50 and the 10 zone to keep all the level 10s out would be a good way of doing it. So that if you're level 50, you can get there right away. But if you're a level 10, you're not going to get through because you haven't killed the level 30 NPC that drops the key to that area. So some sort of gate, some sort of right, right of passage almost. Yeah, something to just prevent people of lower level from accidentally wandering out of their depth without realizing it. Okay. So I will say this, I agree and disagree at the same time, because I'll tell you, I really like the thought that I could stumble across a group of level fifties, let's say, and I'm level 15 that are farming. And I know what they talked about in the streams in the past, you know, where like you're running through and all of a sudden you come up on a, uh, uh, specter camp and you know there's like some high level characters they're farming and you're just like oh what's that and this you know you're dead because you didn't think to con what these were like i kind of like that a little bit because at the end again it makes me pay attention but i do agree you know there should be some sort of like you should see red flags going off like it might not be visible or you might not catch it at first type deal but like as soon as you go back and realize where you made your mistake, you're like, oh wow, I should have been able to see this, this, and this. All of these things should have combined to me going, I need to be paying attention that I'm not supposed to be here. Or like, you know, something like that. Yeah. I mean, take Oasis of Mar. You were talking about the specters. There's that little tower in the middle. Yeah. You have to swim across this pond, climb up to this kind of evil looking tower that's glowing green, and <laughs> yeah. The specters are there, and they will kill your ass. Yeah, quick. Compare that to, like, Nectulios, where there's the Shadow Men camp that is just in the middle of a newbie zone that you could accidentally wander into. The mobs are invisible, so you don't even see them coming. <laughs> and brutal. suddenly you're getting murdered. <laughs> oh, That's so a brutal. less fun. Yeah. Well, again, though, I, I like I like some of those thoughts, though. I like I like having that learning curve that, that, like, oh, what just happened? Are you kidding me? Type deal, you know. And now you know, and you know everybody else that knows you has been made aware because you're telling them about it. Do not go near that. Like, yeah. you don't want to be anywhere around that area. And hey. it's also one of those things, though. This is what intrigues me about stuff like that. It, like, for example. The, we'll say the, you know, like the pyramid pretty much where the specters are at. Like, yeah, you died at an early level there. But now your goal in the back of your mind, or at least mine was, was I'm about to get max level and come back here. I'm going to figure out what's up there. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. you know, so it, it, at the same time, I do agree. Yeah, you stumbling across some of these things, of course it makes it, it it's rough. You might die. Things don't turn out the way that you want them to. You know, you didn't con something you should have, and all of a sudden, you know, you're you're laying face down. But at the same time, for me, it was one of those things where every time that, like, for the brownies, I get that extort, that story before. Um, you know, for for specters or for any of the shadow man, like anything like that, where I stumbled across it, it killed me, and I'm like, wow, how, what level is this? 
I always made it a point to want to come back to there and get my revenge and figure out what was there that was so important, why these high levels were there, and you know what was going on. Sometimes it was nothing. Sometimes they were just there to be there. Most times, in case in, in EverQuest, but um, there there could be a reason for them to be there in my mind for Pantheon. There there could be not just a farming thing, but there could be some rare spawn that drops that you know is there in the camp that I may be one to look for. Things like that, or if I see like for example, um, what was it? Uh, it wasn't Kazakh Thul, was it? It was something else. We talked about it before in a row, where the it was like a hill giant or sand giant, but it was a named sand giant, and he would just kind of wander the beach every once in a while, and I, I forget his name, but anyways, like he would. I remember first time I ever saw him, I was like, wow, the dude is massive, and I didn't even think to con him. And then all of a sudden, it was just one of those deals where I'm I'm now dead, and I'm going I'm <laughs> going to figure out a way to come back, and we're gonna settle this. Like, you know, it was one of those deals where you just had to have that interaction, that like upsetting moment, to kind of get a fire lit underneath you to go. I've got to come back and settle this. I can't leave this like this. And I think that made the game more enjoyable for me. It gave me something to look forward to. It wasn't like. Okay, when, once I hit level 10, I know I can go to this zone. Once I hit level 20, I know I can move on to the next zone. Once I hit level 30, I know I can move on to the next zone. It wasn't like that. It was more like, I'm level 10, I just died to some something. I don't even know what level it is. I just know it's red to me. And I know I'm going to come back and I'm going to I'm gonna settle this the right way. Like, I'm going to figure out how hard this thing really is. And, you know, of course, it was one of those things that it made it more exciting to me. So, I agree to an extent, there should be some sort of warning. A, gl- a giant green glowing pyramid that you have to make a s- extra effort to get to. Think about it. But at the same time, people are curious. I'm curious. People want to explore. And they're going to run themselves into them circumstances. So I do like that. That you can kind of get there. You can stumble across that. And then you can set kind of that revenge tone. You know, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to make a point to come back to this. And those things are going down. And that to me is exciting. I like that thought. So, yeah, I think I, okay, I, I got to shut the podcast off. So here, one second, guys. So uh, with this, I'm going to keep going with this. I, I got some a few other things I want to ask the guys because I got some fun things I want to talk about. Um, man, this hour goes by so fast with the podcast. So everybody listening on Pantheon Radio, I really appreciate you tuning in tonight, hanging out with us, listening. We will get the YouTube version of this posted up here shortly so that we can do some reruns. But I'm also going to keep going on with Twitch here for the next little while talking to mass and day and i've got some things i want to run by them even more so that i think we're gonna have some variation variations of opinions on so we'll find a way to get those to where people that are on pantheon radio or elsewhere can listen to those as well i'll figure out a way to make sure that everyone's aware everyone's aware of them and able to listen to them in the future so stay tuned for that make sure you're following either me on twitch or twitter whatever it is so that you know when we're going to be doing the podcast you know how to get to us or how to reach us and please send us questions to respond to, answer, talk about. I'm trying to get a lot of different opinions and people into the the podcast, you know, here in the next few weeks or even longer, because I, I like hearing people's opinions on different parts of the game. I like throwing ideas out there. I like theory crafting. We're going to be doing a lot of that here coming up soon. So excited about the future when it comes to the podcast, guys. I really appreciate everybody on Pantheon Radio staying tuned, sticking around. I'm going to go ahead and shut down that, and we'll continue on Twitch here in just a minute. Thanks, everyone.